are live, even though I say live, we're not technically live. This was recorded a few days ago. So we are, but I am saying we are live with Seyfedina Moose, who I've learned a ton from. I'm just holding up all your freaking books. And like, it's pretty impressive the amount of stuff that you've put out here. And uh, I, I just want to start safe with, for those people who don't know you, sometimes I think your context of your story, of your background, like, I don't know how much you share about your upbringing, but I want to ask you about economics and fiat and Bitcoin and everything. But how did you get to this point where your views are shaped the way they are? Like, where were you born? Who's your family? Because I think for me, uh, you know, my upbringing shapes a lot of my beliefs today. And I don't know all of your upbringing. Can you, can you share a little bit about yeah, that? I'm sure you've shared this before, story. but I'd like to hear it's a long story. I've been uh, upbringing for quite a while. <laughs> kind of, uh, so I was uh, born in the West Bank in Palestine. And then as a kid, I lived for a few years in Saudi Arabia, for about six years in Saudi Arabia. And then we lived for two years in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. And then I lived in Jordan for a year. Then I moved back to the West Bank in Palestine, to Ramallah, where I lived until the uh, age of 18 when I finished high school. And then I moved to Lebanon where I did college. Then I uh, did a year in London for a master's degree. And then I did a PhD at um, Columbia University. So I was in New York for five years. And then I, uh, yeah, so then I went, I moved back to Lebanon where I studied, where I started teaching uh, economics at the Lebanese American University. And that's where I, I wrote the Bitcoin standard and then since then, I've basically been in Bitcoin. I've been living in Bitcoin, you could say. <laughs> yeah, you have. What, why all that movement before you were 18? What was going on there? Um, just my father was a doctor and um, he got a job in Saudi Arabia. And then he wanted to do his specialty in plastic surgery with the, um, what was at that time, the foremost expert in the world, a, um, a plastic surgeon in Brazil called uh, Pitangi uh, uh, and so he went and he took us and we dragged us there for two years. And then we moved back uh, to Palestine. He wanted to go back to Palestine. So we moved there. So then at 18, going back to Palestine, your worldview is now completely different living in Saudi Arabia, living in Brazil, coming back to Palestine. Is this when you kind of see behind the curtain a little bit and try to question what's going on in the world and your place in Palestine and the way, you know, I don't know, life there? Like, when do you have this realization that the world is a little bit weird? It it was to come uh, more, uh, it was to come later. It was, it, was, it was to happen in New York, really, when I was doing my PhD. Because up until then, you know, you're still learning more about the world and you're still waiting to um, figure out how everything works out. And it doesn't quite make sense. But then I think towards my, uh, when I was doing my PhD, uh, that's when I, um, that's when I, you know, st I started studying economics and then I uh, understood money and central banking and gold and all of that stuff. And that's when it really blew my mind that, yep, this is a pretty big deal. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then when you, so when you have that moment, then when you're in New York, now that your, your understanding of economics is, is, is what it is and your, your understanding of money and you teach everyone all these, you know, kind of wonderful concepts, when you've kind of looked behind the curtain of the way the fiat world is running right now, how do you keep yourself sane? Because I think sometimes you see so much of the pro problems of the world. You know, it's kind of like looking behind the Wizard of Oz for me a little bit. Like once you, like I understood it with real estate. I, I'm like, oh, okay, hard asset. You know, this is something that can outpace inflation. But then when you really start to do a deep dive into this, you kind of look at everything and just start to question it. How, how, how do you keep yourself seen or do you is it just like this maddening quest to go deeper down the bitcoin rabbit hole yeah i think um really the answer the one word answer to your question is bitcoin bitcoin is what helps me stay sane it's what allows you to think yep yeah, this can uh this uh, you you can have a future in this world so with Bitcoin, you're able to step out from all of the craziness that you see around you and just decide. I can still manage to maintain my own life and figure out how to make um, myself live well while everything around me falls apart and goes crazy. So without Bitcoin, I think I'd be in a very different place. Uh, that's really the short mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just... Um, 
there's there's a lot going on in the world that is wrong and it's 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 tempting to sit and dwell on it and uh, uh you know think about it's it's true ramifications but you have a life to live and so you need to um you know sort yourself out every day you need to get up and um do the things that you need to do Okay, so I, I want to read a passage from your book. So for those people listening who don't know Saifedean, he is the author of The Bitcoin Standard, The Fiat Standard, and Principle of Economics, which I thought I would have read by the time of this podcast, but it is so thick and so dense. It's really good that you've laid out all these concepts. I have not completed it, so I'm shamefully admitting to you that I have not yet completed it, but I am going through it, so thank you for it. But I want to read you this passage, and remember, we have people listening to this from all different backgrounds. Some don't understand some of these concepts we're getting into, and I, I just... I want you to explain this. This is from the Fiat Standard, page like 66. It goes on for two or three pages, these passages. It says, the problem with Fiat is that, is that simply maintaining the wealth you already own requires active management and expert decision-making. You need to develop expertise in portfolio allocation, risk management, stock and bond valuation, real estate market, credit markets. Then a few paragraphs later, you say, the correct and successful financial strategy under the Fiat Standard is to constantly take on as much debt as possible. Be meticulous about making all payments on time and use the debt to buy hard assets and generate future, future events. Two more sentences. Under a fiat standard, users are incentivized to accumulate hard cash flowing assets instead of accumulating more fiat, which continu continually continuously loses value. The path to financial success under the fiat standard lies in acquiring hard assets. Can you just kind of walk someone listening through this who's not quite there yet? What, what the, you know, if for someone who's still in the mindset that debt is bad in a fiat world, what, why are you talking that the path to success is actually taking on more debt? Because I think, um, so what I do in the fiat standard is that I analyze the way that the fiat system works in the same way that I did it with Bitcoin and the Bitcoin standard. And I try to lay out the mechanics of how it works and therefore the implications and the economic implications of the way that Bitcoin is run or the way that fiat is run. And so when I do that, um, you realize that the way that fiat mines new tokens, the way that new fiat tokens come into existence is through the process of credit generation. So whereas in Bitcoin, you have the proof of work solution, in gold, you have to mine, you have to dig under earth to get uh, gold nuggets out and then process them and turn them into uh, solid gold. Um, with fiat, the way new fiat money comes into existence is through lending. Uh, anytime a bank creates a new loan, it's making new money. Anytime a central bank issues more credit, it's making more money. So that's how the money supply increases. That's where the money supply comes from. And so in that sense, you'll understand why everybody in the fiat system needs to get into debt because there's no difficulty adjustment. There's no limit on how much debt can be created. There's no hard limit. It's not like with Bitcoin where we have a fixed number of uh, Bitcoin tokens that need to be created. And so every time you create more debt, if you manage to create more debt, you are making more money. And so you're allowing the bank that is issuing you the loan to make more money, to literally uh, create new supply of money. And so therefore, that's profitable for them. So they can cut you in on that deal, basically. And that would allow you to uh, benefit from it. So it's really the only way to beat inflation because in this situation, you know, everybody's taking out debt. So if you hold on to fiat money, if you put money in a savings account, you are being the sucker in the game. You are the one who's losing purchasing power because the fiat creation is devaluing the money that you have. And so on the other hand, if you have your liabilities denominated in fiat money, that's how you can win in the system. So if you're in debt, then you are witnessing your debt decline in value over time. And that's protecting you to an extent from inflation. And so that's what it really comes down to, in my opinion. It just makes a lot of sense to get into debt in the fiat system. That's how it works. And that's why individuals, corporations, governments, everybody is up to their eyeballs in debt in the fiat system. Okay. So if it's valuable for these guys, and I'm just playing devil's advocate with you here a little bit, why in, you know, in large parts of the Western world now are interest rates just going through the roof? Because that's obviously going to prevent people from going into debt. So what's the, what's the play here by the, by the, the central banking system? 
Well, so the way that they see it is they look at the world through something they call the Phillips curve. And according to the Phillips curve, there is a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. And the uh, the whole thing, this is really the, the, the premise that Keynes gave to economics, which is a load of nonsense. And it says that it's the amount of spending in the economy is what determines the state of the economy. And so when there's a lot of spending, then that leads to more economic activity. It leads to more employment. It leads to um, inflation potentially. When there's too little spending, then you don't get enough employment. So you have unemployment, but you have a decline in prices. So in their mind, there's always this trade-off where either you have high unemployment or you have high inflation. You can't have both be low and you can't have both be high. It's like a seesaw. That's the entire Keynesian frameworks because according to Keynes, it's all determined by the level of aggregate spending. If your aggregate spending is too high, then you have inflation and no unemployment. If your aggregate spending is too low, then you have unemployment but low inflation. So that's how they look at the world working. And so in their mind, the way to fix an inflation problem is to basically put people out of work. That's the genius way in which they do it. And so they're always obviously tempted to reduce interest rates and because reducing interest rates means creating more money and creating money is highly popular politically because um, you know everybody wants free money. And so if you promise people to print money to give it to them, um, the majority of them are going to want to be beneficiaries of it. The majority of them are going to think that they're beneficiaries of it. Uh, but realistically, the vast majority are victims of it. Um, so it has still always got large contingencies. There are always people that want to print money. And so they lower the interest rates in order to accommodate the desire for people to borrow more, to have access to more credit and more money. But then when inflation hits, you know, they also don't want inflation to be very bad because uh, politics is also the politics of inflation are also not very popular. So then how do you fix the inflation? You fix the inflation by reducing um, the level of aggregate expenditure. And you can do that through raising interest rates. Another way you can do that is by reducing government spending, obviously, but um, understandably, these people <laughs> don't mention that one. So there is an easier way of doing it, which is you know um, make you poor, basically. And so they raise the interest rates. And then that um, ruins uh, a lot of people's businesses, puts a lot of people out of business, puts a lot of people out of work. And that then translates to lower levels of aggregate expenditure. And that then leads to the reduction of inflation. Okay. So here in Canada, a lot of people are convinced in the, that have a cursory knowledge of maybe economics or the housing market. We have a real mismatch in supply demand here and housing in this just particular area, which is a little ludicrous, but the, the details of that are, are not necessary for our discussion. But I, but I am curious that a lot of people who are watching some of these markets are convinced the real estate market here in this part of the country, Canada, is going to collapse because interest rates will keep climbing, climbing. Nobody's going to be able to make these payments. They're going to keep rates, quote unquote, higher for longer. The, the entire real estate market comes tumbling down. My mind goes to um, with debt this high and the banking system, this important to everything. They don't let that, ha there has to be some change in policy to not let that happen. When you hear me say that, do you think I'm crazy or do they keep rates higher for longer? And they let the real estate market in this country just crush itself. What comes to mind when I say that to you? I honestly don't know. So, I mean, I don't really, um, I mean, one of the, I remember when you were saying what keeps you sane is Bitcoin. And so Bitcoin means that I can look at this thing with the detachment that I attach to a sport that I don't really follow. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. it's like hearing about the NBA scores. I'm not really a basketball fan. I don't really watch NBA and so, you know, I have a cursory, um, uh, you know, I just hear people sure. talk about it occasionally that, you know, the, the Nuggets won, I, I, I believe, uh, the last time. Um, yeah. And that's about the extent of it. So this is the nice thing about being in Bitcoin, that fiat economics becomes like that. And so that saves me from having to second guess these people because mm. there are a lot of nicer things to do in life than to try and second guess what central bankers are going to be doing. So 
it's really not clear to me. I mean, the rationale here is that you raise interest rates and then you hope that you achieve a soft landing. But I think that's um, likely wishful thinking because you can't really just achieve a soft landing. There's going to be a lot of businesses that get liquidated because interest rates rise. They can't refinance at these high interest rates. So you get massive amounts of liquidations. Having said that, um, there is on the other side, you know, we're getting these liquidations, but on the other side, we also have uh, the destruction of the value of the currency, which means that nominally, at least the bull market in pretty much anything can continue um, indefinitely as long as you devalue the currency enough. And so on the one hand, it's tempting to say that prices of houses in Canada or the US are going to crash. But on the other hand, that implies that the Canadian dollar or the US dollar or the local shitcoin in whatever you're, uh, you're referring to is going to significantly appreciate effectively. Because, you know, a lot of people hold, the, hold their wealth in houses. And so um, just because bad things might happen in the housing market, just because interest rates are going to rise, doesn't suddenly make buying the Canadian dollar an attractive proposition. So therefore, um, most real estate bag holders effectively are just going to sit on their bags, perhaps. So I don't know. I, I can't really give you a, mm -hmm. a decisive answer about how this goes, but, uh, uh, but your mind's going to the same place. My mind goes is like, why would they, how could they possibly with a debt to GDP in Canada or in the West, however you call it, let the fiat currency appreciate against scarcer things. I just don't understand how that's going to play out. Like, I feel like I'm playing a hand of poker. I'm playing a game of poker and I can see the central bankers cards and they're bluffing me. They're saying, Hey, I'm going to keep rates high. I'm worried about inflation. I'm worried about the currency losing value. We're going to raise rates. We're going to keep rates higher for longer. You have to be conservative. You have to be careful with your funding. But behind the scenes, they know they have to let the fiat game continue, which means devaluing the currency further, especially with the debt to GDP in countries like Canada and the entire West out of whack the way it is. Like, I think, you know, when I, when I look at the international in Institute of international finance, I think it's one of these banking institutions and they publish that debt to GDP ratio. It's like $3.5 of debt globally. When you add everything up to every $1 of economic activity, however, they're kind of measuring it. And at that ratio, I just don't understand. I think their biggest threat is in a fiat world, raising rates so high that you create a deflationary psychology that requires then an inflationary response or a liquidity response so great to change people's mindset that it's rather dangerous. So we don't have to get into this, but that's just kind of my mind. I'm like, Jesus, where yeah. are they? Where are they headed with this? Yeah, uh, I really don't know. It's... Um... I mean, I, I must say, if it was, I mean, uh, as a not too close follower of those things, I'm surprised they've gone this far. Um, so maybe they don't have much more left in their uh, raising and hiking and hawkishness. And, you know, a big part of trying to get a big bang for your buck in terms of hiking is to make the market believe that you are serious, that you are committed to continuing to hike. So maybe they're... Um, playing tough and sounding tough, but maybe they'll ease up soon. Um, who knows? I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, it's the government is the biggest debtor. The US government and um, the local governments, wherever you are, they are the biggest debtors. And so they would be hurt uh, from appreciation of the currency or from slow inflation. They would be the ones who benefit the most from fast inflation. So you'd, you know, given the track record in history, you would probably bet on them managing to get their inflation. But who knows? Yeah, I guess who knows? <laughs> um, what, um, after writing these three books now and completing, you know, the principles of economics, what, what do you think people need to understand or would you hope understand about economics that previously they did not before reading the book. What What is your mission here, Kana, with principles of economics? What are you trying to kind of unleash on the world with these books? Mm. I think if I were to um, maybe 
I mean, there are many concepts. The book is 18 chapters. There are a lot of individual concepts that I think are very important. So the concept of time preference is enormously important. I think people would benefit enormously from learning that. Um, understanding what capital is, how capital works, uh, is also very important. Understanding um, the economics of energy, understanding marginal analysis. All of these are very important points that I think uh, people would uh, benefit enormously from. But if I were to think of the kind of overall mes message of the book, the point that I try to communicate overall from the entire book, it would be the idea that um, uh, uh, essentially our ability to have civilization as human beings is inextricably dependent and linked to our ability to develop a capitalist economy and have a division of labor with the use of capitalist economic uh, production and live in an extended market order where we are able to trade with one another and have a sound form of money and use that to coordinate our economic activity so that people, and, and in order for that to happen, you know, on, on a very concrete level, the concept of economic calculation by me is really is entirely and completely central to it. You need to have um, individual capital owners able to perform economic calculation on the capital that they own in order to figure out how to um, allocate it to the most efficient uses. That's what it really comes down to. And so if we have the ability to accumulate capital and to own it and to do with it whatever we want, and we live in a situation in which people can expect that to be the case, and people have security about this and have fairly high level of certainty, or I should say perhaps low level of uncertainty about the fact that this thing that I own can be mine in 10 or 20 or 50 years. If you have that, then people are able to cooperate. People are able to um, engage in trade with one another. People are able to perform economic calculation. They're able to use their capital productively. And we're able to produce far more than we could produce if we had been isolated from one another. And so it, a lot of people sometimes think, you know, it's it, you're being um, edgy by saying, you know, you can live on your own or that, you know, um, you don't need to respect civilized mores of behavior or that capitalist um, production or the respect for property rights is something that we can just get rid of, that we could build a society that doesn't depend on those things. But I think um, what I'm trying to communicate from this book and perhaps the, the, the kind of really um, essential concept behind it is that all of the things that we have, all of the nice things that we have as human beings, all of our, you know, all of these things like, let's say, being able to survive the winter with a fairly high degree of certainty, you know, you know, you're not going to freeze to death through the winter because you can relatively easily for most people in the world afford um, the technology that would allow you to survive the winter. You know, you can get heating and um, a shelter. And so being able to survive the winter, being able to live away from diseases, being able to trade with other people, being able to secure the goods that we need, being able to be so protected from nature and from animals, um, all of those things, they're not things that we should take for granted and we should sit down and appreciate the enormous level of uh, coordination and um, really capitalist production that it took in order to get to this place where we can live in population centers, crowded population centers next to each other and relatively be peaceful. That's an extremely difficult thing. And in order to make it happen, we need to accept the rights of people to own property. We need to behave in a civilized manner. We need to trade with one another. We need to have a form of money that is honest, that doesn't uh, ruin people's ability to make economic calculation. And if we do all of those things, we get to have civilization. And if we don't do all of those things, we don't get to just um, get the fruits of civilization that just because we take them for granted. We, we can't just assume that we are going to continue to have them. It's far more likely that um, we're going to lose them gradually. And, but uh, so, so there's the kind of, um, you know, um, pessimistic, cautious message of um, a lot of things around us show us that 
capitalist civilization is unraveling around us and our ability to have a modern civilized society is essentially unraveling. But then there is the um, um, the, the, the hope and the, the hopeful uh, viewpoint, which is that uh, human reason and technology always finds a way to uh, make its way through adversity. And I think, um, you know, the real problem that we're facing is the fact that our money is broken. And the solution that we're going to come up with is that our money, we're going to fix the money, basically. I think the the what your books helped me kind of crystallize is I never understood that money was information. Like money was communicating to me some information. I always just thought, oh, it's like, I don't know, how much can I get for my Canadian dollar or something? I don't know. I, I just never thought of it as accurate information. But then it, reading your books helped me crystallize the idea that part of the reason that our own business exists is because we have to be defensive with the dollars that we accumulate. And a lot of people are forced to go into real estate as a protection mechanism mechanism on their fiat dollars. So they end up buying a hard asset with it. And then you get these industries like rockstar real estate and you get the whole financial sector, which is really just exists to kind of invest those dollars so they don't lose purchasing power. And the distortion that's communicated through the money is so great that it's taking swaths of the population away from their higher, highest and best use in an economy and forcing them to spend time in an environment. Like sometimes I think of all the people of Rockstar Safe. I'm like, can you imagine, you know, we have wonderful, there's probably like, I guess, almost 70 of us now. I go, can you imagine you took all these wonderful people with these, all these wonderful brains and they were doing something else that was serving the economy instead of all of us working to help Canadians take their purchasing power and kind of protect it. Like, why are we doing this? Like it, yeah. it shouldn't have to exist. And it, your yeah, books you know, everything you we're always, we're always making uh, jobs uh, obsolete and we're making things more efficient. We're finding ways of doing things that are less labor intensive, that require less human time. And this is one way in which we're doing the exact opposite. 150 years ago, well, you could do this. We could all get this by just holding a gold coin. You didn't need any of this stuff. You didn't need to understand yeah. the commodities markets and um, real estate. Interest rates. And, uh, and, and interest rates and stock markets and try and second guess what uh, Jay Powell is going to do and try and hire yeah. PhDs <laughs> and quants um, to take two and 20 in order to be able to figure this stuff out for you. All of that was available for you. And all you needed to do was just buy a gold coin. And now we've made it so much more complicated and sophisticated and expensive and time consuming. You know, um, uh, you'll be a brain surgeon, but you'll spend your time trying to figure out how to maintain your, uh, maintain the wealth that you've already earned. I mean, you've already become a brain surgeon and you've already done the brain surgery. You've gone through med school, you've suffered through all of that. You've done the surgery now, and now you need to figure out how to get to keep your money. It's insane. It's criminal. How do you, uh, do you, you know, when you think of how this evolves now that there's Bitcoin, I feel almost like there's people who understand Bitcoin and there's a second community. I don't know. It's not like a nation state in and of itself, but there's like this other community globally that seems to be growing. Is this just a tandem monetary system that through Bitcoin evolves and then it, it kind of grows it, with your hope? It would continue to grow in value and grow in activity and users and just a bunch of us kind of segue from a fiat system into this kind of beautiful Bitcoin system. How do you see this evolving? If you just have to guess, like, I know we don't have the crystal ball, but how do you see this evolving in five, 10, 15, 20 years? Yeah. I mean, this is kind of my optimistic way of looking at it in that um, I don't think we're going to necessarily go through a global Venezuela. And the reason for that is that we have Bitcoin as an alternative. Venezuelans, um, you know, they, they didn't have alternatives. Um, I mean, they kind of do have Bitcoin, but still Bitcoin has, has very little um, uh, reach in Venezuela overall. It has helped those who are using it, but I still think it's still um, it's, it's still pretty early days, but it's growing. And the more it grows, the more it's going to help us when um, we go through crises where currencies collapse. So I think the kind of optimistic way of looking at it, and that's the kind of... Um, thesis of the fiat standard. And that remember, as I was saying earlier, that you get money, fiat money is getting, is getting created every time you make new loans. 
Well, as Bitcoin rises, people are probably likely to want to hold on to fewer loans over time because now you don't have to borrow. You can just accumulate capital, uh, accumulate Bitcoin rather than um, continuing to get into debt. So one way in order, one way in which you can protect yourself from inflation, as I was saying earlier, is that you get into debt and now your liabilities are denominated in dollars. Another way of doing that is that you just hold Bitcoin and then you don't give a shit about what happens to the dollar. That's my preferred method. So you hold Bitcoin, you expect Bitcoin to appreciate over time. And that means you don't need to get into debt. And so that means fewer people take on debt. What that means then is that fewer dollars get created. So this is quite counterintuitive. Mm. People think that if Bitcoin rises, then the more Bitcoin is being used, the more everybody's going to dump the dollar and then we're going to have hyperinflation. But if you look at actual examples of hyperinflation, it's never been because people dumped the money. It's always been because these printers went into overdrive. But the printers of fiat, as we mentioned in this modern system, they're not physical printers. They are digital printers. And they make new fiat every time new loans are generated. So if Bitcoin undercuts the demand for creating new loans in fiat, then it reduces the creation of new fiat money. And so it eats at demand for fiat, but it also eats at supply for fiat. And so effectively, that can help us avoid a um, Venezuelan situation. And now everybody can just, anytime you start realizing that this thing isn't working for you, you just upgrade to Bitcoin and then things work much better. Why do you think it is that some humans and is somewhere in a place like Venezuela, I remember my own family going through some elements of this, but don't jump over. What is it that makes it difficult for them to leave their currency behind and come into something that is a harder form of money like Bitcoin? Like, Why is it that there are people in Venezuela? I'm sure you've given this some thought, like I sometimes think about, it. I'm like, I don't understand. Like, why don't they just grab the harder form of money? Is it just humans don't like change? Like, is it it's just as simple as that? Some humans just don't like change. So they're like, no, I'm just going to keep going with my currency the way it is. Yeah. It's kind of dispiriting, to be honest. It's uh, kind of depressing. Yeah, it is. No, <laughs> a lot of people just continue to hold on and continue to want to believe in the currency that they have. And there's not much you can do about it. Um, I mean, in terms of um, evangelism, there's a limit to what you can achieve, but I think eventually um, it just, uh, economic reality eventually imposes itself because, you know, eventually you need to start asking for alternatives because if you don't, you just don't have any more economic resources left. Do you can you can you see a way that uh, I guess some sometimes I think oh geez like there's someone like me born in Canada parents are immigrants to Canada born in Canada but now I'm thinking oh do I spend more and more of my time elsewhere rotate around the world a few a uh, few different places is, is Bitcoin going to make nation states starve and crumble a little bit in in your theory like to me every time i guess every time i purchase some bitcoin or exchange some fiat for bitcoin i always think i'm starving the beast i don't know that's what i tell i I, to me it's always like hey i'm kind of starving the this fiat beast system here does this just kind of slowly erode and i guess that's what you were implying with your previous answer but is this evolution where just nation states lose power and there's another another form of kind of organization between people um, who are using a common money? I think so. I think this is the case. I think this is what we're getting. I think um, ultimately we're going to um, find that people are better able to maintain their wealth because of their ability to access uh, uh, a form of money that can't be robbed. You know, the money that we had um, given to us by governments is money that is optimized for stealing from you. It's money that's um, really optimized for the government to be able to make more of it so that they can take your wealth and repossess it to themselves. Well, now everybody has access to a form of money that they cannot, that governments cannot print any more of. And so if you just hold on to that, then you are able to provide for your future self 
and you're able to reduce the certainty around the future for yourself quite significantly. And so I think this is quite uh, useful. I think it's going to truly be remarkable, the impact this has on humanity. Because just look at any any single person that you find, no matter where they are from, um, you know, just look at their life story over the last 100 years and imagine if all of the wealth that was taken from them mm-hmm. by inflation and all of the government actions that were financed by inflation that happened to them, if they weren't to happen, and if they had managed to keep that wealth to themselves and spend it as they see fit, how much better their life would be, you know? Pretty much everybody in the world has witnessed their currency destroyed in terms of its value. Every single currency in the world has lost more than 99% of its value in the last uh, 55 years or so. Every single one of them. Every single one. So if your grandfather left you something 50 years ago, um, today it's worth less than 99% if it was denominated in the currency. And that's what people had been saving in at that point. Uh, Up until that point in history, this is what people had gotten used to saving in, you know, the national currency. So now take away all of that inflation and all of the episodes of hyperinflation and all of the banking collapses and take these away and imagine where your life would be today and where the life of people around you would be today. Now imagine that's what we are going to be doing for the next 100 years thanks to Bitcoin. And that gives you, I think, a nice place to um, begin to consider the economic impacts of Bitcoin. Yeah, you know, I I have this vision sometimes. I was fortunate enough to go to uh, my family's, uh, my father's parents were in Croatia in a village just off the coast, off the Adriatic coast, about 30 minutes inland. And there was a village there and I would go there in the 80s and it was like you were going back into the 1800s, safe, because they're in the village, everybody would take care of each other. And there was older people in the village and that's where the wisdom was passed on. Like the older people in the village passed on like how you were going to dry out a prosciutto or why you're using animals in a certain way. They're, they were like a store of knowledge. And because they were in the village and didn't have to worry about interest rates or coupon clipping or kind of their day-to-day survival, there was this knowledge that was passed on. Like they were older, so they kind of sat around in the shade a lot. They didn't like do that much because they were older, but there was this beautiful knowledge transfer that I was able to witness and I feel in in kind of in the modern world today, the, the those wise elders have been replaced with elders that have to coupon clip, have to be worried about their income, have to live on a pension and are always worried they're going to, you know, their purchasing power is going to be diminished. So we as a society have lost all this wisdom that could be passed on because we have an older generation in kind of the modern world that is so preoccupied with the currency collapse of their purchasing power, they don't have time to pass on wisdom that they've gained over their years, if, if that makes sense. And I feel like Bitcoin has the opportunity to bring that back, that if people can save and in when they're older years, not worry about loss of purchasing power, they can spend their time in comfort and contribute back to the society in a different way than they have been over the last perhaps 50 years. I know I'm probably Absolutely. dreaming and this sounds maybe crazy, but that's just where my mind goes. I'm like, the v- but you're not the only one. Yeah. 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 To me, it's like this, yeah, this kind of beautiful vision, but uh, I just want to kind of get your ideas on or, or thoughts on what are you tracking in the Bitcoin world? Is there any kind of things that you track, like the lightning network usage, or is there anything that captures your attention that you're like, Oh, that's an interesting development. Noster. I don't know. Is there something that you're tracking that, um, keeps you abreast of what's happening in the Bitcoin world or, or not really, you just kind of are studying it, write about it, live in it. And you're not interested in any of the different stats that maybe you could pay attention to. I mean, I, I, I'm following all of these uh, stats that you mentioned in a sense of, you know, keeping up with those things. I think though, uh, um, really the, the, the most important adoption metric realistically though, is the price. That's really the only, um, it, it, it's really the only kind of accurate measure. If the price is a measure of all of the amount of um, Bitcoin um, that is held in cash balances at this point. And that's really the, that, that's the ticker for adoption. Ultimately, what matters, you know, before Bitcoin gets used as the coffee um, purchaser of choice for the world, people need to first build cash balances in Bitcoin. The person who sells the coffee and the person who buys the coffee coffee need to both have um, cash balances in Bitcoin so that they are both able to um, 
make a transaction around Bitcoin and accept the increase or decrease in the balance around the Bitcoin. So we're in a race to get more people to stack more sats and to get more um, cash balances denominated in Bitcoin. That's honestly the, um, I mean, it, it does sound um, kind of uh, too simple. Yeah. Too simple and too superficial and, you know, almost uh, too materialistic. You know, um, I'd probably be more popular if I said things like, you know, it's about the technology and it's not about the money and it's not about the price. But really, it honestly, it really is about the price. Saying that Bitcoin is not about the price is a little bit like saying, you know, I'm I'm not interested in um, cars for transportation. I'm interested in cars for the technology. Well, the whole technology of a car is to transport things and people. So, I mean, if you're interested in it as a curiosity, um, even as a curiosity, the point of a car is not to make a toy for you to play with. It has to perform a function. It has to move things. And so that's really the point of a form of money like Bitcoin. And so the network really truly dies and lives and dies by its ability to continue to appreciate and to continue to hold on to value. I think if Bitcoin was expected to lose 20% of its purchasing power every year, I think it would fail. I think a very, very, very few people would want to hold on to it. And then the amount of cash balances that are held in Bitcoin are going to be enormous. Uh, in, uh, sorry, tiny. They're going to be tiny. There's not going to be anybody holding serious cash balances in Bitcoin. And so therefore, there's never going to be any kind of transaction being denominated in Bitcoin because um, you know, nobody wants to hold the Bitcoin. So the person who receives it is going to want to sell it immediately. And the person who wants to pay it probably doesn't own it because you know they don't want to hold on to Bitcoin. So we need the uh, size of the cash balances to appreciate, and we need the value of the currency to appreciate every year in order to incentivize people to hold it in order for the cash balances to increase. So that's what it really comes down to. I think uh, we need more uh, big hodlers to come in and to keep um, adding the demand for Bitcoin and adding the demand for uh, transactions um, in Bitcoin and um, increasing the size of cash, cash balances in Bitcoin. And I think, you know, as this happens, while the value stored in fiat money is dissipating, that's how Bitcoin grows and achieves adoption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. You give me flashbacks to like my tech life where I think uh, people kind of made fun of technology in the early 2000s after the tech crash and how uh, how people just kept using it. And uh, I feel kind of the same with Bitcoin that it almost doesn't need any advertisement other than the price. You're right. If it doesn't go away. Cause my own, my own journey through Bitcoin is after the 2017 price collapse. I remember I was a gold guy. I, th I didn't understand the scarcity of Bitcoin. I didn't understand the pure digital scarcity of Bitcoin. I had not taken the time to go down the ra that rabbit hole. I didn't understand that. And I remember looking at the price of Bitcoin. This is interesting that you're saying this to me because it was, it hit 17,000 us or whatever it hit. And then I think a year later I looked at the price and I was kind of laughing because I told my brother, Nick, I said, you know, we'll just start the rockstar coin. What is this Bitcoin thing? We'll just start the Rockstar coin. I'm a database guy. I'll just uh, start this uh, Rockstar coin. And I looked at the price and the price of Bitcoin at the time was maybe 4,000, maybe six. I can't remember a year later, around 4,000. And it shocked me. Like it, it stunned me because I had assumed it would have gone to zero. Like when it had that, that kind of, uh, that price up, I had assumed it must be zero or a hundred dollars. So when I remember, even though I didn't jump into the, to down the rabbit hole until 2020, uh, during the pandemic, reading your book, the Bitcoin standard, I remember that moment did stun me. I thought, oh, like how, why is this thing not zero? You know, and I kind of moved on, but it was a price thing. That was the thing that stopped me in my tracks. You're right. And I would imagine that some people are having a similar reaction right now when the price had run up to where it has, and now it's come down. And today, whatever the price is today, you in US dollars, 27, 28, 29, 30,000, whatever it is, I'm sure it's stunning some people. You know, so yeah, I, I think that is the right way to look at it as well. Um, is if someone wants to approach these concepts, how would you tell them to approach your books? Like the Bitcoin standard, the fiat standard, and the principle of economics. I meet a lot of people who do all of a sudden want to get a better understanding on economics. Like they, they are trying to go down this rabbit hole. How do you tell them to approach your books? Is there a certain order based on objective that you like to share your books? Or how would you articulate this to someone? I think if I were if I wanted to start um, from scratch, I'd start with the last one with principles of economics. 
So I uh, begin with that one um, because that'll give you a good idea about economics. And then the Bitcoin standard and the fiat standard. Um, you could also read them in the other order, fiat and then Bitcoin, I think, uh, also works. But probably Bitcoin standard first, just because it was chronologically written first and builds on the Bitcoin standard. So I think if you do it this way, you get the, the kind of overall economics picture and then you're able to get into Bitcoin and fiat. But if you are interested in learning more about Bitcoin rather than learning economics in general, then um, you you can totally start with the Bitcoin standard and do the fiat standard and then do principles of economics uh, afterwards, because I think, you know, hopefully you'll like it enough to want to read my third book. So um, knock yourself up, whichever order you want will work. Ultimately, they, they are standalone books. Um, but if I were to choose, I'd say principles, then the Bitcoin standard and then the fiat standard. And then after that, if someone wants to check out the, you know, the teachings that you're doing now, where do they find you? Is it on your website? How often are you doing different lectures online? Like what, what is your schedule like now? And where do people find more if they want to go down this rabbit hole deeper? Yeah. Safedean.com is my website. So if you go to safedean.com, you can sign up to take my courses. Uh, we have five courses right now, uh, based on my three books. And starting in September, I'm going to be offering a new course for principles of economics, which is going to be based on my uh, new book. So initially, I did the courses, and then I made the book based on the courses. Now I'm making a new course based on the book. That's how I kind of um, constantly iterate. And so starting in September, you can sign up and get the new course. But now you can also access the old courses. And that's the recorded material. But then also, if you get the plus membership, then you can uh, join our weekly seminars. We've got two seminars every week. Um, that you can come and join where we discuss the courses and the material and Bitcoin in general and economics in general. And then also we have, um, uh, th this is also my podcast. So I get guests and then I release these seminars into my podcast, which is the Bitcoin Standard Podcast, which you can find on um, all uh, podcast platforms, basically. So you can also listen to that as well. Say, what's driving you at this point? You figure out all this stuff. You know, you've written these books. What is keeping you going? You've answered the same question on economics and money eight million times at least. What what is driving you at this point? It's my job. I do it. You know, why, why does the mailman keep uh, putting the mail in the mailbox? It's um, that's my job. That's how I put food on the table for my kids. <laughs> yeah, got I'm, it. I mean, yeah. On on the one hand, it's that simple in the sense that. Um, I think ultimately, if you want to do something sustainably, it needs to be um, done professionally and it needs to be a job because otherwise you're not going to have the motivation and the um, ability to continue to plug at it, to continue to do it. So that's, um, I think that's kind of the functional trick of why I keep going. But I think the deeper answer is that uh, I keep going because I want to, because I think this is important and uh, there's a lot of things that are wrong there are a lot of things that are wrong with the world. And I think um, I want to find out how much of that um, fiat causes and how much of that Bitcoin fixes. I really do. I'm extremely curious about this. And I, I, I look forward to life because I want to see how this uh, changes and how it unfolds and how much better life can become. Yeah, and you have been so patient. I'll never forget when I first discovered you and I joined one of your live lectures and you opened it up to questions. And I thought, oh my gosh, I can ask this guy a question. Like I, I'm going to ask, I didn't understand deflation at the time at all. And I asked you like the most basic question. And I think it was something along the lines of like, how can deflation work? Like how will prices go down or something? I forget what I said. And looking back and you answered it very patiently. And I just look back and I thought, oh my gosh, like th this guy has answered so many of these questions over the years. So thank you for your patience and dealing with people like myself, because I feel like since stumbling upon your teachings, I've come a long way in my own economic understanding. I have a better understanding of how our own business fits into the world that, and, and what we do here. And thank you for your continued contribution in all these areas, because you're not only improving my understanding, it's changing the life of my own family and this understanding and my children and kind of what we are doing in the future. So Thank you, Safe, for, for everything you're doing. It's really appreciated. And I know you're moving right now and you kind of you're in a brand you're in your brand new office and you're uh, you're doing this. So thanks for taking the time to do this as well. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Tom. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Always uh, I always enjoyed chatting to you. 
Hey, thanks for tuning in. You can find every new episode of the Your Life, Your Term show on all the major streaming platforms. So Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together, like these right here, or some of the reports that we've put together, like these right here, you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it for now. Until next time, your life, your terms. Your life, your terms.